praising God while expecting a breakthrough is an act that most people find difficult. To praise God when things are hard, you need to see beyond what you want. Your eyes need to be able to see the things that are beyond the physical. Above all, you need to be able to cultivate a life of absolute praise, irrespective of the circumstances. Praising God should not only be an act of gratitude for what has been received, but a lifestyle of worship that glorifies the Father in all things. You are created to bring glory to God, to praise Him always. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4.18, While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. KJV This should make you know that the problems you see around your life are temporary. They will not continue forever. They will pass away. The latter part of the verse says that the things that we do not see are eternal. This indicates our hope in God. The things God has in store for everyone who holds on to Him are eternal. They are long-lasting and are more real than the things we can see with our physical eyes. You should rejoice in this hope and never allow your heart to stray away from trusting in God. David repeatedly said in the scripture that his hope is in God. No wonder he lived a life that was filled with the wonders of God. When you put your hope in God, your heart will be able to praise Him even in difficult times. Satan's goal is to steal your joy. He wants to make you sorrowful and then doubt the efficacy of Christ's power to save you. Giving in to despair is giving Him a chance to win over you. He will rejoice when He discovers that He has succeeded in making you morose. Isaiah 12.3 says, With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. NIV It is when you praise God that your joy will find expression, and you will be able to activate that joy to receive your blessings. Have you tried out this mystery before? Try it today. When you have your joy intact, you make the devil go mad. It takes a lot from you to look away from your needs and focus on the majesty of God. But that is what you need to do to experience the untold joy that will put you in the position of receiving your answers. Do not allow your present condition to make you conclude that God is not faithful. The Bible is a testament to God's faithfulness from ages past. God has been faithful. He is still faithful, and He will remain faithful. Jehoshaphat was the king of Judah when some strong nations rose against them. The battle was a lost one for them already from a human perspective. God stepped in and changed the narrative when Jehoshaphat did something profound. Jehoshaphat was afraid at the news of the army approaching them, but his fear drew him closer to God. After seeking the face of God, he received an instruction that seemed unintelligent. They were told not to fight because God will fight for them. Praising God in difficult times might look like that to you too, but as unintelligent as it seems, it's the key to receiving victory. When you praise God, you acknowledge Him for the things He has done before. You extol the beauty of His holy name like the angels, saints, and 24 elders are doing. It's like you joining the host of heaven. Do you think He would not come down when He is being appreciated? Compared to where he is talked down on or belittled with thoughts, imaginations, and words of mouth, God will always show up where his name is magnified. Instead of complaining about the things that you think he has not done, praise him for the many things he has done. No matter how bad things are, you can at least find one thing to thank God for. Even if the only thing you can thank God for in your life is for being alive, it's still worth it. Despair, anxiety, and panic will not bring the solution you seek. It is time to drop what doesn't work and pick what does. Let your belief in God push you to praise Him even before you see anything change. When the Israelites were moving to Egypt, they encountered an obstacle on their way that could have terminated their journey. That is Jericho. 
God gave Joshua an instruction, and as always, God's instructions always look foolish to man. The Israelites were told to march around the Great Wall of Jericho, which even the strongest man or instrument couldn't knock down, and shout loudly on the seventh day. How could a mere shout bring it down? The people followed the instruction keenly, and to the glory of God, the wall came crashing to the ground. Choose praise. You have to deliberately fight against losing hope. Never give in to the pressure of everything you're going through. Do not lose to despair. The obstacle before you will come down when you praise God from the depth of your heart. Praising God will keep you joyful, even in the storm. I encourage you to maintain a life of praise to God. Let the first thing that would come out of your mind be glorifying God. Let your testimony be that in everything you faced, you did not curse God with your lips or heart. Praising God is an expression of confidence in God's faithfulness. The Bible says, through prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known to God. Phil 4.6 The Bible did not say your complaints or murmuring be made to God. You cannot take your request to God if you do not believe that he can salvage the situation. When you grieve like those who have no hope, it's a sign that you have not allowed God into your situation. Do not look at the storm. Look at Jesus. Keep your gaze, focus, and attention on the one that can help you out of your difficult situation. David was a man that had a lot of trouble during his days, yet he had a track record of praising God. He was anointed to be king, yet the present king wanted him dead. His siblings did not even regard him. He could not live in a house anymore and had to move from one valley to another, hiding from Saul. He fought wars upon wars and had one thing that made him distinct from many other characters in the Bible. He was a man of praise. We have the book of Psalms, full of his songs of praises to God. With the glory that later came from his life, he was a forefather of Christ. We know that praising God is worth it. It is normal and not special to praise God when everything is going well with you. When you receive a piece of good news, you will immediately rejoice. But when it is not the news you are expecting, how do you react? It is human to be sad, but then that should not steal your joy. That is why God gave us joy and not happiness. Joy is what makes us rejoice even when the physical situations are unfavorable. That is what will bring praise to your mouth when every situation looks bland. Praise is a powerful tool that every believer ought to utilize. The power of praise cannot be overemphasized. It is tragic to live without something to be grateful for. In essence, there is no one who has nothing to be grateful for. Even in the darkest tunnel, God is still faithful. Having the strength to pass through the situation is enough to be grateful. You know it's always darkest before dawn, so when everything seems dark and dreary, you should praise God because your breakthrough is right at the door. One minute to your breakthrough might still not look like anything will come. Can you imagine how tragic it would be to give up at that moment? That would mean a loss of all the years of waiting. Praising Him is a ticket for you to get the things you're looking for. Praising God strengthens your faith in Him. When your faith in God is strengthened, despair will not find a way into you. Your faith will shut out every sense of fear that might want you to seek other alternatives apart from God. Praising God will make God your focus and not the problem. When God is your focus, you will maintain complete trust in Him because all you will see is Him. Seeing God in comparison to your problems will make you know that your problems are little compared to His power. Praising God moves the hand of God to come into your situation and do all He has promised to do. Praising God works on you and makes you joyful. I have never seen anyone who praises God and yet remains in a sorrowful and mourning state. Praise is a fetcher that will bring joy into your heart. 
thinking about the things God has done in the past for you, people around you, and even characters in the Bible will make your heart assured of his faithfulness. You will see that if he did those before, he can do more for you. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hope deferred makes your heart weak, but the Bible has another reality for those who put their hope in God and not in man or themselves. Isaiah 40:31 says, But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. NIV. Keep your hope in God alive to be a partaker of this promise. The strength you need to praise God in difficult times is available for you already. Take it and begin to utilize it until you receive everything you believe God for. Make God happy for the things he's done for you. Give back to him in gratitude. Your money cannot get to him. It can only be used for his work. It is only your praise that is a service you are rendering directly to him. I pray this scripture over you. Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Call on God for the strength to defeat giants and break strongholds. As time goes on in life, you will come to realize that you are not in control. Even scientists can attest to the fact that there is a force somewhere that controls certain events and is superior to every other force. This force is God. He is the supreme God, and the scriptures confirm that all power belongs to Him. As a human, I can confidently say that we are limited. There are situations in life that will knock you down without prior notice. You will encounter forces that will defile all solutions and resist all oppositions. Beloved, this is the time when you need to call on God. He said in his word, Call unto me in your days of trouble, and I will answer you. At specific checkpoints in your life, you will encounter opposition. Different Goliaths will challenge you, some of whom will question the existence of God in your life. Some will seek to jeer at your faith and hope in God, and certain failures will also push you into doubting all that God has said about you. I want you to understand that when I talk about giants, I am not only referring to humans who have extraordinary heights, weights, and body sizes. When I talk about giants, I am talking about everything, a person or situation, that is stopping you from enjoying the rest and life that God has promised you. In the book of 1 Samuel 17, 1 through 25, a certain descendant of the Nephilims called Goliath was brought up by the Philistines to war against the Israelites. Before the battle began, he used his height to intimidate the soldiers in the camp of Israel. He taunted them and cursed God threatening to make a public shame of the entire nation of Israel. You do not need to be told, the soldiers became really terrified, and none of them could step forward to defend God's people. This ugly scene continued until David showed up. He was not different from the other soldiers, other than the fact that he came with God. When David came up against Goliath, he did not boast of his credentials, he did not trust in the power of his money or strength, but boasted in the Lord his God. While the Philistine cursed David and threatened to feed the voracious birds his carcass, David gave him a reply that summarized the secret behind his victory. In 1 Samuel 17:46, David replied to him, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty and the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. 
This happens to be the secret of David's repeated victory throughout his lifetime. It is recorded that he fought about 66 battles, but lost none. Why was that? Was it just because he was smart and strong? Or was it because he was experienced? The answer is this. David knew how to call on God for strength. He knew how to rely on God and not lean on his understanding. He acknowledged that he was no match for the giant, but did not fail to call on God. To be frank, we all have some type of Goliath that we wake up to meet. It stares into your face and whispers to you, you can't do anything about me. Sometimes we let them scare us for the better half of our days on earth. Some other times, we try to fight them with our power and wisdom, and guess what? We keep failing in every attempt, save for the fact that you did not lose your life on the line. I may not know what your Goliath is, but I know that God knows it even better than you do. God is probably waiting for the David in you to arise and call on him, the mighty man in battle. He is waiting for you to come to the end of yourself so he can show forth himself to be the all-powerful God who is working through you. God is interested in your life and the battles that dare challenge him in your life. If you are sure that you are a believer, then I need you to change your perspective of every mountain that is standing before you. You are a child of God, and therefore, you are not the one who has been challenged. God is. When you begin to see things from this perspective, you will no longer be intimidated by whatever the enemy says to you. You will not be ashamed of the names that people call you. You will not be afraid of the confrontations of people in certain areas of your life where you are experiencing trials. I understand that these trials and even temptations may seem drilling. There may be times when you feel weak and abandoned to make it worse, some individuals will mockingly ask you, where is your God? In all of these, I need you to know, while you are limited in your strength, God is unlimited. This is a great reason why you need to call on God for strength. Goliath was bigger than David, but he was not bigger than God. That cancer may be bigger than you, the diabetes and the like may be said to have no cure. But if any of these happens to be the giant you are fighting against, then there is good news for you. Jesus still heals terminal diseases, including death. Of course, bringing back the dead to life is not just the old Bible tales, it still happens now. Zechariah 4.7 says, What are you, O mighty mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you will become level ground. Then he will bring out the capstone to shout, God bless it, God bless it. I need you to read this Bible verse again, and this time, insert your name where Zerubbabel is written. For I know that God is leveling every mountain that has blocked your way to better days today. One thing I have come to know about God and how he works is that he is faithful. With him, there is no fear of, what if my prayers are not answered? As long as you do not retain iniquity in your heart, he will keep to his word. Sometimes, the strength you need is already there, so he will often speak his word to reassure you. This is for you to understand that you are not disadvantaged because of your physical appearance. Some other times, he will simply give you knowledge about the weakness of your opponent. Just like in the case of David, where he helped David see that Goliath was covered on every part of his body except his forehead. It was this knowledge that gave David insight into the type of weapon that will be perfect for bringing down the enemy. Depression is a form of a giant. You may have been tackling it with different solutions or weapons, but to no avail. If you call on God, he will help you overcome it for good 
And who knows, that may be the secret that many other depressed souls will learn from you to break free from the claws of this emotional canker worm that has led many to early graves. When you begin to feel like you cannot take it any step further, when it seems like you are being swallowed up by the heat of any challenge, call on God. There is no giant too tall for him to defeat, no mountain too high for him to level, and no wall too thick for God to kick down. He is the Almighty and true strength comes from him. God does not only empower you to be able to stand against physical, financial, and mental giants, he also gives you the strength to pull down and break demonic strongholds. Luke 10:19 says, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy, and nothing will harm you. This verse says, nothing will harm you. If believers all around the world can understand their place and the authority that has been given to them, I believe they will do better than allow the enemy to oppress and torment their lives. Strongholds are persons, forces, principalities, and emotions that are on an assignment in your life, which is to limit you and to make sure that you never become all that God wants you to be. While you keep crying and fretting around, God keeps looking at you and saying with a calm and subtle voice, Child, use the authority that you have been given. In some cases, you do not necessarily need to be anointed afresh. You only need to exercise courage and speak the word of God. Sickness does not understand tears. It only understands the word of God. Likewise, the forces that you are up against do not understand a common plea. They only understand God's word and obey it when it is spoken with authority. This was the case with Gideon. He was a valiant warrior who thought of himself to be everything less than that. God did not only empower him to bring deliverance to his people, but God also gave him the strength to pull down the idolatrous altars that his father's household had erected in honor of other gods. Jesus made a public show of the powers of Satan by his rising from the grave, and now he has given you the authority over all these powers. You have the authority to speak over worry, and it will depart from you. You have the authority to speak against fear and command it to expire in your life. This is your benefit as a child of God. Maybe you have been waiting for an impartation from God. I would not say that is bad in itself. However, God may be saying to you, Warrior, arise and speak my word. Arise and get ready to sing songs of victory because you have never been weak. You have only been terrified and intimidated by the size of your opponent. Beloved, if you have been waiting on God for empowerment, then here it is. God is saying to you, do not be terrified, for I am with you. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Fear is a parasite. It will feed on your faith. It will subtract from your strength and help you look down on yourself. If you have been so fearful and nothing has been able to remedy that, you need to call on God. You may have all the strengths in the world, but if fear is resident in you, you will be oblivious to the wonder and edifice that you are. Rise today and conquer the camp of your enemies. March on with boldness, for the Lord of hosts is with you. Irrespective of a man's past, God's arms are always extended wide to him. Men from many backgrounds come to God in their natural states. For instance, we all approach him as sinners, some as failures, and some as broken people. God has never stopped receiving everyone just the way they are. However, he is committed to molding something beautiful from their lives. But I have noticed that 
Not everyone who identifies with God obtained the same level of transformation. Likewise, during the days of Jesus' ministry on earth, not all the sick brought to him obtained the same level of perfect healing. Some were healed and some were made whole. Then I asked these questions. Is God partial in his dealings with men? Or does God have favorites? Well, I found the answer not long ago. Romans 2.11 says, For God does not show favoritism. God is not a respecter of any man. He is never partial in his dealings with men, as he is a righteous and just God. Remember, for whatever a man sows, he will reap. This explains it all. The best of God is reserved for those who will sow the best of themselves. If you lay down your life sparingly for the master's use, do not expect to reap a bountiful measure of results. If you do not aspire to get to the point of total surrender before God, if you only want to surrender your finances, do the things of the kingdom, donate massively towards the kingdom project, but do not give up your secret sin. Dearly beloved, do not expect much from God. God is not cheap. No, not at all. Neither can he be mocked. He is the God that causes the sun to shine upon the wicked and the righteous. He is the same who causes the rain to fall on the sinner and the righteous without discrimination. Certain gifts from God are for everyone. For instance, the rain, sun, and wind. Nonetheless, God will be impartial to give the sinners and the righteous the same privileges. Yes, of course. There are benefits exclusively reserved for God's children the very elect, the righteous, those who dwell in the secret place and those who abide in him. Are you one of them? God will be unjust to let you who sow sparingly reap bountifully, like the one who sows cheerfully. This is why he reserves the best for those who see his kingdom as fertile soil to sow in their lives and labor in his vineyard. He will pour out himself into their lives as well. He keeps the greatest treasures for those who see his business as a worthwhile venture to invest their lives and resources. Today, we only consider real estate investments and shares as profitable businesses worthy of investing our lives, time, and money. I do not intend to talk down any of these things, as they have their values and importance. However, I want you to understand that real estate is not the best investment venture. The best is God's business. You do not have 100% assurance of profitability in all your investments. There is always the possibility of losing your resources. But with God, it is different. No man gives anything to God in vain, no matter how little. God does not owe any man. He does not cheat. And most importantly, he has a reward for anyone who gives for his course. So the question is not why God deals differently with men, what men need to do to trigger the best results. The best you can give to God may be your time, money, or even yourself. It may also be your motive behind giving any of the things mentioned above. John 12, 24 says, I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. This Bible verse speaks a lot about the conditions attached to your decision to follow Christ. A lot of believers follow Christ, hence they are called Christians. However, their lives lack the premium results of Christ's followers because they have not paid apt attention to what they must do. In this Bible verse, the best the kernel of wheat has to offer is its life. It remains a seed until it gives its best. In the same vein, you will remain a seed until you give your best. Catherine Coleman of Blessed Memory, who was a friend of the precious Holy Spirit indeed, would always say, I am not special to God. Whatever I have, the results you can see all be yours if you can pay the price. In essence, you can choose to give nothing to God and only enjoy the benefits of every living being, which means you would be sharing the same privileges with unbelievers. Or you can give your best to God and become the best in your home, territory, and generation. It is not up to God, it is up to you. All the impactful and blessed followers of God who left marks on the sands of time paid the price. If it is a toxic possession, then you would have to lose it forever. Things like a bad temper, 
a jealous or envious spirit, and lust. You will have to give them up for God to replace them with positive analogies, such as self-control, joy, and love. What happens if what you need to give to God is not something bad? What if it is you, your talents, zeal, or time? That is where the struggle lies. When you can give your bad possessions to God, you will be transformed and made a new man. But if you cannot let go of what seems good to you, then you will be a transformed believer with no tangible results that can stand the test of time. We tend to struggle a lot when it comes to giving God our best, yet that is where the best of us lies. God takes the bad things in you and replaces them with the good. He takes the good things you give, refines them, and makes them even better. The single life of the kernel of wheat was its best, but come on, it cannot be compared to the best it received from God, which was more seeds. The disciples of the Lord Jesus, who later became his apostles, gave their very best. They gave their occupations, time, and even their lives. Even though they lived over 2,000 years ago, their impacts are memorable. They are patriarchs of the kingdom of God, and they were the best version of themselves. Someone may be saying, well, that is for the so-called ministers of the gospel. How about Father Abraham? God called him out of his home, where he was born, raised, and built his life around. He gave up the comfort of his home. For the better half of his life, he was all sold out to God. He was not called to be an evangelist or a preacher, yet he gave his all. He even went as far as trying to give up his miracle child, Isaac, whom he awaited 25 years to have. If you ask Abraham, I guess he will tell you that he knew he had to give his best to be the best. In 2 Corinthians 8.3, Paul said of the church in Corinthians, For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. There are three things to pay keen attention to in this verse. They gave as much as they were empowered to, which is the quantity of their giving. Secondly, they gave even beyond their abilities, which talks about the quality of their giving. And lastly, they gave willingly, not out of compulsion. This is the complete definition of the best anyone can give. The Lord Jesus also gave his all, his crown, life, and glory. He came down to be a man, even though he was not less than God. He gave his life, glory, and ambitions to walk down the lane of death on the cross of Calvary so that you could live. That certainly was his best. Today he is seated at the right hand of God because that was the greatest sacrifice ever made by a man. It is not that God has gone bankrupt and needs you or your resources to recover from a mess. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. God could have been able to give you everything without your input but it would be against his patterns. It is simply a basic spiritual principle called the law of seed and harvest, or better still, the law of sowing and reaping. No one sows palm fruits and reaps apples. It is against the law of nature. In the same way, you cannot give God your minimal attention and expect to produce the same results as someone who gives God his maximum attention. That will be an injustice to the one who gave more. 2 Corinthians 9.6 says, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. You must also understand that your best may not be someone else's best, so do not compare your results with that of others. The best time you can give to God in a day may be an hour, while for a friend it may just be 10 minutes or 20. If your friend gives his 10 minutes faithfully and cheerfully, he will see his results as much as you who give an hour will. This is not partiality. It is God's way of being fair. That is why Jesus said, To whom much is given, much is also required. Remember that you cannot be rooted in God and have no results. It is impossible. Therefore, I charge you to examine some factors in your life, especially if your life has been void of results. God cannot be the one doing it wrong. It has to be you. What will it cost you to get the best that you desire from God? Have you been giving your best in terms of quantity and quality? Have you been giving your best out of compulsion, necessity, or love? Ruminate on these questions. 
Per adventure, you are in the category of those who believe they have nothing to offer. I implore you to have a paradigm shift in your mentality. The thought that you have nothing to offer is a lie from the pit of hell. You do have something to give. God has fashioned you with potentials that are above your comprehension. Moreover, God will not ask you for what he knows you don't have. It may be out of your ability. That is where sacrifice comes in. Your efforts, hard work, and resources can make you the best you want to be if you give your best to God. I believe Christianity would be soothing and rosy if the devil were someone that easily gives up or grows weary. Unfortunately, he never gets tired of tempting believers or trying to make them stumble in their walk with God. This is why one has to be rugged and brutal about one's faith in this present age. The world system is getting wiser and the schemes of the kingdom of darkness are designed in such a way that they weaken the faith of those who believe in God. It's disheartening to know that there are people who once had faith in God. I took a survey and found out that one major reason for this is a feeling of abandonment or disappointment in God. The devil has won the battle over the souls of many. His tested and proven tool is raining incessant troubles on believers. This frustrates them into believing that God has forsaken them. Since the devil's tactic is persistent pressure through spiritual attacks, you need to fight back with persistent faith. The book of Ephesians 6.16 says, In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Whatever the enemy does against the life of a believer is aimed at his faith. You may be wondering why he keeps bringing up one challenge after the other, from financial strains to emotional distress, from your spiritual life to your physical body. He keeps shooting his shots. Don't keep wondering when he's going to get tired. I have the answer for you, and it's never. He will not stop. Therefore, it is left for you to put up an impenetrable shield to avert all the schemes of hell against your belief. Faith is not just the currency with which you can receive answers to your prayers from God. It's a spiritual weapon of warfare. Apostle Paul, in his letter to the church of Ephesus, called it part of God's spiritual armor. In his description of the shield of faith, he said it is capable of putting off all the fiery darts of the enemy. This means that irrespective of the weight of whatever the enemy is bringing upon you, your faith is all you need to put off the heat, pressure, and confusion that comes with it. Have you watched a war movie? where one party releases flaming arrows into the camp of their enemy? The immediate effect is usually confusion in the camp. That is exactly what the enemy expects of you when he sparks up an unpleasant event. Just like in the movies where the attention of the attacked group is divided as some of the soldiers focus on putting off the flames, the devil also intends to divert your attention while he executes his primary goal. Your faith is the shield with which you can quench the fire. If you do not have your faith strongly rooted in God's word, when the enemy strikes, you will be forced to run helter-skelter trying to deal with the heat of the situation. This gives the enemy wider room to annihilate you. When you receive a not-so-good report from your doctor regarding your health, what do you do? Do you go about telling everyone what the doctor's report said and confessing negative things? Or do you calmly go to God for reassurance and healing? Do you fret and throw questions of unbelief at God? Or do you use it as an avenue for God to manifest his healing power? If you go on doubting God and being all pessimistic when things do not play out as beautifully as you planned them, then you're not getting ready to win the battle that the devil has unleashed on your faith. 
he destroyed his relationship with God, and he finds it intimidating to watch you thrive in God's love. Because he has no godly standards, he will go to any length to make you curse God. My question to you is, what will it cost you to have an unshakable faith in God? Would you rather have the devil push you to turn your back on God? Beloved, cursing God out of pain, frustration, and disappointment is not worth it. You need to gauge up against the pressure that comes with standing for and with God. There will be times when God's answers to your requests or queries will not come immediately. There will be times when he will seem to be silent. That is why you need to build your faith. It's okay to start up with a small and weak kind of faith, but it's not okay to remain that way. As you grow in the knowledge and the things of God, you should also grow in your trust in him. One of the unforgettable stories about persistence that I've read from the scriptures is that of the widow who troubled the judge. Although the judge did not consider her plea at first, he had to give in to her because of her consistency. On this account, Jesus said in Luke 18, 1, Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. Whether you accept it or not, your enemy operates by the natural law of consistency, which says, In consistency lies the power. Being consistent in your trust in God is the only way you can level up against him. Just like he told Eve in the Garden of Eden, he will try to make you see God as the bad guy. When God's promises take time to come to pass, he will present God as a liar. In times like these, your trust in the unchangeable God is what will determine your response. You may not know how faith aligns with prayer, but one thing that proves your level of faith in God is a fervent prayer life. The widow in this parable believed in the position and authority of the judge to help her out of her situation, and for this reason, she kept coming back to him. You can't say you have undying faith in God when you do not pray to him. This is part of the works without which the scriptures say your faith is dead. The moment you begin to feel too discouraged to talk to God in prayer, know that your trust is dwindling. At this stage, the enemy is capable of playing with your mind. He's capable of feeding you with ungodly thoughts and having you change your mind in the process. When you pray amid a storm, the peace that God gives you cannot be compared to any assurance from this world. Prayer is not just a weapon used in sending spiritual arsenals to the kingdom of darkness. It is also a tool for growing and stabilizing your faith. No matter how you feel, after praying, you receive reassurance and comfort from God. If he tells you to knock and it will be opened unto you, you trust him. If he says, seek and you shall find, then you keep seeking until you receive your request. This is the definition of persistence. Results or no results, you keep hoping that God will show up at the best time. The apostles who happened to be the first of Christians faced persecution in every way possible. They were physically tortured, locked up in prisons, and encountered shipwrecks during missionary trips. The magnitude of the attacks they received from the enemy was enormous and almost unbearable but they kept on looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of their faith. They didn't trust God today and deny him tomorrow in the face of affliction. They were consistent and firm in their decision to believe in God more than anything and to further demonstrate the brutality of their confidence. They loved not their lives even unto death. Until you come to the point where you make up your mind to stay with God irrespective of what comes your way, the enemy will keep sifting you like wheat. If your hope in God is shallow, you are likely to give in to Satan's continual incursion. It doesn't make sense for you to be able to stand on the Lord's side when things are pleasant, 
while you take a bow whenever the slightest trial comes your way. Nevertheless, if this is your case, I want you to know that there is still hope for you. Don't feel guilty or depressed for being unable to take a stand for God in the face of adversity. Come to God and tell Him about it. The good thing about God is, He does not condemn you for having little faith. He encourages you to feed on His Word and grow in faith. Romans 10.17 says, Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the Word of Christ. The Word of God is the major source of Christian faith. It teaches you about the person of God, and it encourages you through the dealings of God with the patriarchs of faith. The deeper you grow in the knowledge of the Word of God, the deeper your roots of faith. When the enemy has tried jeopardizing every other aspect of your life to no avail, he will then try to directly stop you from the vow of godly devotion. He will try to make you too busy to fellowship with God. He will try to keep you away from the Word of God and make you compare prayer to lifting blocks. Just like in the case of Job, Satan attacked Job's wealth, family, and health before speaking, using Job's wife to ask him to curse God so that he would die. I don't know what aspect of your life the devil has been persistently waging war at, but I need you to do one thing. Do everything the Bible encourages you to do to ensure you stay with God. Your confidence in God cannot be firmly anchored if you are far away from God. A little instability in your trust is what the enemy needs to make his flaming arrows land successfully in your life. If your adversary does not relent, then I implore you not to relent as well. Your consistency in trust has to be more consistent than the attacks of the devil or else you may be caught off guard. Focus on building your faith, not on stopping the enemy from launching more assaults. You have no control over his activities, but your faith can shield you from all his flaming arrows. Stay rooted in faith. You are fighting a defeated foe. Your victory is certain. Life is not a respecter of any man. Whether you are poor or rich, whoever you are, life keeps shooting its shot. Life keeps handing over weights and cares to everyone, most times beyond what they can bear. As long as you breathe, you cannot escape life's burdens or challenges. Christians, however, have an advantage in life. We have a God who can be anything and everything to us. He can be a father, he can be a friend, he can be a teacher, and also a burden bearer. He helps us to carry the unavoidable burdens that life throws at us. Psalm 55, 22 says, Cast your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous fall. This is a word of encouragement from a man who has experienced God in every facet of his life. You should get used to the fact that you cannot successfully filter life away from the hurdles that come with it. They are a part of life. And to get better in life, you need to know how to handle each of them. Turning them over to God is the best decision anyone can ever make because he has a perfect history with those he has sustained from their burdens. The fear of failure, fear of the unknown, and all other negativity have limited many people from attaining their life goals or the peak of their potential. With the recent happenings in the world, the economy can no longer be predicted. There is a widespread financial burden on how to make ends meet, settle bills, and live a good and comfortable life. The pressure is not going to stop. People will keep on chasing money, luxury, and comfort. The race will keep on going until the world comes to an end. Some of your relationships weigh you down so much to the point you need a shoulder to lean on. There will be moments when you won't even trust others enough to want to share a part of you with them, and that is when you need God the most. You may wonder why you have to cast your burdens unto the Lord. He has eyes, and he can see that this is a burden. Shouldn't he just help? I have heard a few people asking similar questions, 
And all I can say is that God has principles which he will never suspend for the sake of anything. He respects your will, and if you decide to handle all your burdens alone, he's not going to stop you. Matthew 11, 28 through 29 says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. It is your responsibility and choice to come to Jesus with all your burdens. It is his responsibility to give you rest from them. He won't take them away from you by simply guessing they are burdensome to you. You must be tired of bearing them alone and want to be helped. Sin is a burden. Some people can keep on deceiving, thinking, and convincing themselves to believe that sin is a form of enjoyment and can stop at any time. But I know that when the consequences and the emptiness that accompanies each of those acts of unrighteousness come knocking at the door, the narratives will change. Negative addiction of any kind is a burden. However, Jesus said all should come, including addicted sinners. Where you come from does not matter. The years you've been carrying your burden is not the issue. He says, just come unto me. You may say, Lord, you do not seem to understand me. This sickness, this limitation, these weaknesses had become a part of me. Yet, he says, come unto me. Blind Bartimaeus got healed. Jesus took his burden and gave him a lifetime rest from physical blindness. And even though people still refer to him as blind, his story changed. He did not die a blind man. Listen, you must come now. Just come to Jesus while you still can. He will take your burdens and he will take away every reproach. With God, you can be open and have no fear of intimidation or condemnation. He does not judge nor reprimand you for having so many burdens. He will lovingly take them off you and you will find rest in sharing in his yoke. Do not rest on the arm of flesh. The flesh is unpredictable. The flesh is fallible. If you put your trust in men and place all your confidence in them, you have set yourself up for a great disappointment. You have set yourself up for a public display of your secrets. Men cannot carry your burden for long. A time will come and they will want to share your burden with someone else. Have you forgotten the song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus? There is no other friend aside from Jesus. When you cast your burdens on Jesus, even when you do not please him, he will not betray your trust. He does not change his covenant or his will. Have you noticed that the greatest of all burdens are your secrets? You've probably engaged in several activities that no man can fathom if aired. You tremble within yourself every day whenever it crosses your mind. You have knelt down countless times, pleading vigorously for mercy. You have been assured by the Holy Spirit that you are forgiven, but you just can't bring yourself to accept that. It keeps hitting your heart every day. I have a word of hope for you. Believe in God's word. How do you do this? Aside from meditating, make God's word your daily confession. Continually say to yourself that I cast all my cares and burden to Jesus. The Lord Jesus had carried my burden on the cross. Give that burden a name. Say to it, you pains from my past marriage, you no longer belong to me. I no longer bear the burdens of the hurts from the days of my youth. The lamb has taken care of your burdens. I need you to believe that. Beloved, joy awaits you at the end of the tunnel. As soon as you let God have your cares, the refreshing wind that blows on you is overwhelming. Your mind becomes free from hurt. Your steps are well ordered and that hidden smile becomes visible for all. Your joy knows no bounds. Have you noticed? Burdens make you a slave. It becomes your master. You are directed by it. You eat when your burdens allow you. You work perfectly when your burdens give you the chance. You sleep when your burden is made light, probably by music or the words of a concerned soul. Your entire life is structured around those burdens. And that takes me to the word of Jesus in Matthew 6, 24, which says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. That verse is packed with a lot of meaning. When you let your burden bother you, you become devoted to it. You may not know it, 
and you may choose to disagree. But the truth is what occupies your mind is equal to your God. If you are bothered daily by your burdens, it shows you've bowed to a God. Oh, that sounds awful. That is why you must cast your cares upon Jesus. Make Jesus your Lord. Let him take care of your yoke. Let him envelop you with everlasting peace. Some people's burden is not a secret, but the basic needs of life. They struggle, wallow, and cry. They eagerly await financial prosperity. Have I just described you? If yes, you do not have to carry that burden anymore. Why not draw strength from the words of Christ in the scriptures? A particular scripture says that the birds of the air do not work, yet they are well taken care of. Are you not more than birds? That is to tell you that if God can provide for the fish in the ocean, the birds in the air, and the least animal in the forest, he will surely take care of you. He will see to your needs. His wish above all things is that you prosper, and he has made a way to actualize that. He has made wonderful and extraordinary ways. All you need to do is look up to heaven. Cast your needs to him. Don't assume he hears or sees them. You have to tell your father about your troubles, and he will definitely answer. He will show you the way. God is waiting on you. That should make you jump for joy. The creator of the whole universe is waiting for you to cast your cares upon him. His arms are outstretched. He wants to hold you in his arms and wrap you round his chest. He yearns for this, beloved. Let him have it all. Let him have your heart. Surrender your spirit, soul, and body to God. Let him take care of you. He is your creator. He knows how to fix your burdens. Speak to him in prayer, and he will respond unto you. Your responsibilities will come daily. To be on the winning side, do not hesitate to speak with him daily. Sing hymns to him. Those songs are powerful burden lifters. Sing them from the depth of your heart until your voice resonates to God. Also, engage in godly dance. When you dance despite what you are going through, you throw the devil into a dilemma. He becomes confused. And that is the stamp of your victory. Dancing tells God that you are walking in Christ's peace. It tells God that you have decided to let him have it all. Don't waste all your days worrying and murmuring. Don't waste all your time ruminating over your travails. God is here. I see him lifting that burden. Your needs are met. Your secrets are melting away. Your guilt is turning to glory. Your rest has come. Believe it. Own it. For the burden bearer is here to help you. Stop being a slave. You are an heir to the kingdom. The Bible has called you an heir with Christ Jesus. That is who you are. No burden should enslave you. No whispers of the enemy should make you lose your joy and happiness. You are a free man. The Son of God, our dear Jesus Christ, has set you free from your burdens, and you are free indeed. Hallelujah. Nobody desires to be extremely tired and worn out. Weariness can set into your life even at moments when you least expect, and before you know it, you are all down. Everything in life becomes draining and disgusting. Nothing seems to work anymore. You have tried all you could to stay above the waters, but you find yourself sinking in every area. You finally get to the verge where you feel all used up. Then you start searching for renewal through movies, shopping, or endless time without friends. The irony of this step is that it leaves you more parched than you were before. It makes you stay up all night sighing and turning. You keep wondering when the wilderness experience will end. Sigh no more. The water of life is available to you for moments like these. We all know that water is very essential to the well-being of every living thing. Being hydrated keeps a person mentally alert. It aids productivity. It prevents some diseases and also prevents exhaustion. That is for the physical water we drink into our bodies. The same is also applicable to our spiritual life. As our body needs water to stay hydrated, so also do our souls need the water of life to stay alive. In fact, the water of life rejuvenates the weariness soul that has been caused by sin. When the living water constantly hydrates a man, vigor and strength are supplied to run the race. It removes fear and doubt, but instills courage, strength, and grace. 
To stay consistently refreshed and alive in the Spirit, seek out the water of life today. Drink until your heart is filled. Drink until rivers of living water begin to flow out of your belly. Revelation 21, 6. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. In this verse, Jesus stated that he is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. When you get to a crossroad in your life, I hope you will remember this word. You may get to that point where you feel worn out and all your strength is gone. Hope slips out of your heart. You are worn out from the continuous battles in your life. When all these happen, I hope this word will echo in your mind that Jesus is the Alpha and Omega, the one who brought you this far and who will not leave you until he takes you to your glorious destiny. The concluding part of the verse says, He will give those who are thirsty the water of life freely. This is a promise from him to you. He has promised that when you become thirsty, he will give you water from the spring of the water of life. Jesus did not discriminate against anyone in his invitation. He did not say that if you are rich, come, or if you are a Jew, come. He said, as many as are thirsty, let him come to the fountain of life. He is not asking you to pay any price before you can drink the water of life. All he asks of you is for you to come. When you go to him, you have fulfilled your part. You will receive the water of life and drink till your soul is satisfied. John 7.37 says, On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Many passages in the Bible present Jesus as the water of life. His willingness to give everyone who would come to him the water to drink is also mentioned. He stood up on the last day of the feast and called out to everyone. This reveals that being thirsty is not necessarily something to crucify yourself about. I mean, when you are physically thirsty, you don't crucify yourself for feeling that way. You will go ahead to satisfy your thirst. This also means it's normal to feel drained and exhausted. It's okay to feel depleted and dry within. All your soul longs for at such a moment is a refreshing. That is why we long for relationships and things that will make our hearts renewed. However, all the efforts of man to satisfy the longings of the soul have proved abortive. They are all transient and not strong enough to fill the void in the heart. Jesus knew this and therefore calls out to everyone to come and drink the water of life. He, however, stresses that as many would come to him, they would receive a refreshing of their souls. The offer of Jesus still stands today. He is still calling out to everyone to come and drink the water that will make them satisfied eternally. Jesus met a Samaritan woman in Sakar. She was a perfect definition of a tired and hopeless person. She had been in five marriages which all ended in shambles. The man she was living with at that time was not even her husband. She was a laughingstock in her community and was a negative example for others. She went to the well to seek satisfaction for her troubled soul. Glory be to God. She met Jesus, the water of life. Jesus overlooked her ridicule and reached out to her. He told her that if she should drink the water she had come to the well to draw, she would thirst again. This is synonymous with our efforts of filling our tired souls. We keep getting drained and always have to go back for more, but never satisfied. In fact, for many, this has become an addiction. Jesus pro-offered a solution to this long-standing problem of man. He stated that if we would drink the water he is offering, we would never thirst again. The water of life will satisfy our souls. That void that has been created as a result of the fall of Adam would be filled with the water of life. Then you will not have to seek after mundane things to get satisfaction anymore. Her encounter brought salvation to her and the entire city. That restoration of lost relationships renewed their souls from the thirsty state to being satisfied in Jesus. Jesus is reaching out to you today to refresh your heart. 
He will restore strength to you. He will give you the grace to run the race with new vigor. He will restore your passion. He will rekindle the fire in you. He will renew your vision. All these will happen only if you go to Him for strength. He is there already, standing at the door and knocking. He wants you to request the water of life for your thirsty soul. The presence of water in a place makes sure life continues. You will remain alive when you have the water of life in you. Staying away from the fountain of the water of life for a long time is the easiest way to die. You can't afford to stay without the water of life in your soul. The water of life purges and cleanses. The water of life nourishes your soul and prevents spiritual death. It makes sure that you remain refreshed and up to date with your experience with God. The living water heals and comforts. It brings healing and deliverance. It brings breakthroughs and restoration. As beautiful and important as the water of life is to the soul, Jesus reserves it for those who are thirsty. Being thirsty is a sign that you need to drink and quench your thirst. Therefore, you need to thirst for the water of life. If you are still running after mundane things as a means of quenching your thirst, you will never get satisfied, and the water of life will not be given to you. In moments of depletion, don't turn to drugs or any external thing for strength. Those things will only make you more exhausted than you already are. Turn to Jesus, the living water, to restore your soul. Jesus emphasized the fact he is not forcing the water of life on you. He is offering it to you. You have the choice of either drinking or walking away from it. But I will encourage you to drink the water of life today. Life is already hard from the outside. Having to deal with an internal emptiness, exhaustion, and sadness is something too damning to deal with. So, do not overlook the offer of Jesus today. Come to him with your empty vessels, and he will fill you to overflowing until rivers of living water begin to flow out of your heart. Then you can also bring others to drink from him and quench their eternal thirst. Psalm 23, 2 and 3a says, He makes me lie down in green pasture. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. The water of life is there for you to drink and be revived. You do not have to continue in dryness and leanness of soul. Accept the invitation of Jesus today. Go to him and he will refresh your soul. As you drink the water of life, your soul will be revived. Life will come into you again and you will receive strength as you have never had. When you believe in God, you will not find it difficult to go to him when your soul needs refreshing. You will always rest in his presence daily to restore your soul. You do not have to wait until you are completely depleted and no energy is left in you anymore before you reach out to Jesus. You can make reaching out to Jesus your daily practice. Always go to Jesus for daily renewal. Discouragement might set in your heart as a result of some failed attempts at getting a thing. That is the time for you to go to the fountain of life and drink from him. Some conditions might even lead to depression. You might have sought help from a counselor, but do not seem to get things together. Jesus is always ready to restore your soul. He leads you beside the still waters. The purpose of this act is to make you drink from that living water so that your soul will be renewed. The Bible says that those that hope in God will renew their strength. When your hope and trust are in the renewing power of God, you will be renewed. The youth shall faint and utterly fall, but because God has called and chosen you, he will provide constant and continuous renewal for you. He will renew your soul. He will restore strength to you. He told that woman that whosoever drinks the water he is offering will never thirst again. When you drink that water, don't veer off without coming back to drink more. You have to drink and keep drinking. And each time you drink, your soul is refreshed, your strength is renewed, and life comes fully into you again.